A warm welcome to our online service on this, the 16th Sunday after Trinity. Well, today we're going to be uh, looking at the next part of the story of Joseph, uh, where we find Joseph waiting for God to act. As we start our service, let's quieten our hearts before the God who is here with us now. And we say together, the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Joseph's life was filled with ups and downs, and yet through all of it, God remained faithful to him, as he does to us. We're going to sing of that faithfulness now in our first hymn, Through All the Changing Scenes of Life. God's faithfulness to us remains even when we are unfaithful to him. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, but welcomes us back and restores us when we return to him. A moment of quiet as we consider the ways we've turned from him this week. And then we confess together. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. 
for letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. Hear this wonderful promise made by God to us in his word. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. And so may almighty God, who sent his son into the world to save sinners, Bring us his pardon and his peace, now and forever. Amen. Our collect prayer for the 16th Sunday after Trinity. O Lord, we beseech you mercifully to hear the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfil them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Our reading for today comes from Genesis chapter 40, as Brani comes to read for us. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected, so he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, in my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded it blossomed and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favourable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just, to, just as Joseph had said to him in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as I begin today, I want to do a bit of an experiment. Now, if you're anything like me, that will have felt incredibly uncomfortable. Waiting in silence, even for a few seconds, is not a pleasant thing to do. Waiting 
is hard. I've been finding that out this week uh, as I've been waiting for a Covid test result which took a while to come. Thankfully uh, it turned out to be negative. Uh, there's all sorts of things that we have to wait for in this life. Perhaps you're ill and you're waiting uh, for the day when you're restored to health or, or, or for when you hear those words, you're all clear. Maybe you're going through a time of suffering and you're desperately waiting for it to be over. Uh, perhaps you're waiting to be reunited with uh, a loved one who lives far away and who you can't see at the moment. I'm sure all of us are waiting, uh, longing even, uh, for the day when coronavirus is a thing of the past. And if we're Christians, then we'll be waiting for something else as well. Christians wait for the day when the Lord Jesus returns. We wait for that glorious day when we will see him face to face, live with him in his world, restored and renewed. Everything that spoils sickness, sin and death, a distant memory. To be a Christian is to be someone who waits for that glorious future. It's my hope that as we look at this passage together, God will equip us to wait patiently and faithfully for that day as we go through life with all its ups and downs. Now, of course, waiting is hard. It can be excruciating at times. And the central character of our story was no doubt very aware of this. Uh, for Joseph had been waiting for a long time. Uh, at the age of 17, he'd been given dreams by God, pointing forward to a time when his family would kneel before him and give him honour. No doubt, as Jacob's son, he would have also known about the great promises given by God to his father, Abraham, his, uh, to his father, Jacob, to his uh, grandfather, Isaac, and to his great-grandfather, Abraham. Uh, promises made to their family uh, to turn them into a great nation, to give them a land of their own, to bless them and make them a blessing to all peoples of the earth. Joseph would have been waiting to see how God was going to keep those promises and what part in it he was going to play. And by the time we get to the start of our passage, Joseph has been waiting for many years. Uh, sold into slavery by his brothers, jealous of his dreams, he finds himself a slave in the house of Potiphar, an Egyptian official. Uh, we saw last week how a false accusation from Potiphar's wife lands Joseph in prison. There he stays, waiting for God to act, and waiting for the day when he can gain his freedom, waiting for the time when God will fulfil his promises. Now we don't know how long Joseph waited in prison, but one day uh, news goes round the prison. Uh, some important new prisoners have just come in, none other than the Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker. Have a look at verse 1. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. <clears throat> Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. Now, we saw last week that even in prison, God was with Joseph so that he found favour in the eyes of the captain of the guard. And so it's no surprise that it's Joseph who is given the important job of looking after these prisoners. The waiting continues. But then one day, Joseph notices something's not right. As he's serving the cupbearer and the baker, he sees that they're both sad. He's concerned for them. And so he asks in verse 7, why are you so sad? They reply in verse 8, we both had dreams, but... There's no one to interpret them. Now, dreams were an important part of Egyptian culture. It was thought that you could know what your future would be through the dreams you had and possibly uh, take steps to avoid disaster uh, and win success on the basis of what your dreams showed. But interpreting dreams uh, wasn't just something any old person could do. You needed a professional a magician or wise man to show you what a dream meant. 
there was no such professional in the prison and so both the cupbearer and the baker are sad. They suspect the dreams that they've had are significant but they don't know what they mean. Now Joseph isn't a professional magician but he does have experience with dreams. Remember it was his two dreams back in chapter 37 that led him to being sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. But rather than boasting of his experience, Joseph points away from himself towards God. Again, verse 8. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. It's clear that Joseph still trusts God. After all he's been through, brutalised by his brothers, sold into slavery, falsely accused and thrown into prison, even after all this, God has sustained his faith. He still trusts God. I can't interpret your dreams, says Joseph, but I know someone who can. So the cupbearer goes first and tells Joseph his dream. Uh, he tells of a vine with three branches. Before his eyes it buds and produces grapes. He then squeezes the grapes into Pharaoh's cup. Joseph interprets the dream. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to when you were his cupbearer. It's a favourable interpretation. Uh, Pharaoh will lift up the cupbearer's head, a sign of honour and prestige. He'll be freed from prison and restored to his former position. And at this point, Joseph sees his chance to get out. Surely, Joseph thinks, this is God's intervention to finally rescue him. And so he pleads with the cupbearer in verse 14. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I've done nothing to deserve being put in, in a dungeon. I wonder if you can hear the desperation in Joseph's voice. He's been taken from his homeland against his will, forced into slavery and then thrown into prison for a crime he didn't commit. And now finally, there's a chance for him to escape. Maybe the cupbearer is his way out. If he speaks to Pharaoh, perhaps Pharaoh will release him. But first, there's another dream to interpret. The baker. When he sees that Joseph has given the cupbearer a favourable interpretation, he asks Joseph to do the same for him. And it's a similar dream. The baker dream, dreams that he has uh, three baskets uh, on his head, uh, full of baked goods for, the fa for Pharaoh. Uh, but the birds are, are swooping down and taking food from the baskets. And again, Joseph interprets the dream, but this time it's not good news. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole and the birds will eat away your flesh. For reasons we don't know, Pharaoh has decided to execute his chief baker. In three days time, Pharaoh will lift off his head from his body and impale his body on a pole for the birds to eat. Now the baker must have hoped that Joseph had got it wrong, but he hadn't. God's interpretation that he gives to Joseph proves true. It all happens exactly as Joseph said it would. Three days later, it's Pharaoh's birthday. and During the celebrations, he restores the cupbearer and executes the baker. The interpretation that God has given Joseph comes to pass. Now, no doubt these uh, events have filled Joseph with hope. He waits for the cupbearer to speak to Pharaoh and, and get him released. He waits and he waits and he waits. Because the cupbearer has let him down. Verse 23. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. We don't know how long it took for Joseph to realise that the cupbearer had let him down, that he'd forgotten his promise to speak to Pharaoh and help Joseph. But when the realisation dawned, it must have been devastating. 
And so at the end of our passage, we find Joseph doing the same thing as at the start, waiting, waiting for the day when God would rescue him and fulfil his promises. Now, at first glance, it doesn't seem like there's too much for us to learn from this passage. It seems like a straightforward account uh, in uh, the story of Joseph's life. But when we dig a bit deeper, we find that there's much to learn here about a God and his purposes and about how we, as his people, can wait uh, patiently for him. The first thing to notice is that God's purposes uh, rarely run in a straight line from our perspective. Uh, back in chapter 37, when Joseph was only 17, there's no way he could have possibly known uh, how long and how winding a road uh, God would take him on before uh, he fulfilled uh, the dreams he had in that chapter. From Joseph's perspective, uh, those 13 years spent as a slave in uh, Potiphar's house and then as a prisoner in Pharaoh's jail, uh, they must have seemed like wasted years. And yet at each stage of the journey, Joseph is in exactly the place God wants him to be. Each stage of his journey is absolutely necessary so that he can be in the right place at the right time to save his family and the nation of Egypt from famine. Maybe you feel as if you're waiting at the moment, uh, waiting for life to get better or to reach some cherished goal. Perhaps you're starting to get bitter with God. Frustrated because you can't see uh, what he's doing in your life right now. The story of Joseph teaches us that whatever situation you're in is exactly the place God wants you to be. So that he can accomplish his good purposes for your life. His priority for our lives is not to make us comfortable, but to transform us into people who are increasingly like Jesus Christ. And he often uses suffering and waiting to do this. So don't be surprised when God takes you on some a winding, narrow paths. Second thing to notice from this passage is that it, at no point is Joseph forgotten by God. Even when he's let down by the cupbearer, God is still with him, preparing for that moment when he'll be released. Joseph can't see it. But that's what's going on underneath it all. God is still in charge. He's still in control. He's not abandoned Joseph. Now, there may have been times when Joseph did feel forgotten and abandoned by God. And it can often feel like that for us, especially if we're going through a, a period of suffering in our lives. That is a common experience for God's people. It's not something to be ashamed of. Uh, many of the Psalms are heartfelt cries from believers who feel abandoned. God gives us the Psalms so that we can cry out to him in pain and sadness. But although we might feel abandoned by God and forgotten, we are in fact never alone. God is always with us, just as he was with Joseph. That's one of God's promises to his people right throughout uh, the, the Old Testament, I will be with you. One of the names given to Jesus at his birth was Emmanuel, which means God with us. The last thing Jesus promised to his disciples before he ascended to heaven was that he would be with them till the end of the age. And now, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, God has taken up residence in the hearts of all who trust in Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, however abandoned you feel at the moment, you are in fact never alone. The one who gave his life for you will never let you down. He will never forsake you. Final thing to notice. Joseph's waiting does come to an end. The story doesn't finish. At the end of chapter 40, there is a chapter 41. And we'll be looking at that chapter next week and I don't want to spoil it for you. But Joseph's waiting does come to an end. And the same will be true for us if we're Christians. As Christians, we are all waiting for that day when Jesus Christ returns. That day when we see him face to face. When he renews the whole of creation and 
banishes everything that spoils. We will live in that wonderful new creation with him forever. One day, our waiting will come to an end. And that's not some pious, far-fetched hope. It's rooted in the historical reality of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. God raised him from the dead, and when Christ returns, he will do the same for us. Death and everything else that spoils our world will be swallowed up in his victory. The waiting will be over. As I finish, some wonderful words from Revelation chapter 21, which describes what it is we're waiting for. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Amen. And we continue in prayer. Faithful God, thank you that you were with Joseph through all the changing scenes of his life. Thank you that you did not forget him or forsake him throughout his life. Please help us as we journey through life to continue to trust you, even when the route seems hard and winding. Would we know deeply in our hearts that you are with us? And would we eagerly look forward to the day when Christ comes again to renew this world? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign Lord, we praise you that you are the Lord over all the events of this world, including the coronavirus pandemic. Please help us to continue to trust in you as we see an increase in the number of cases in this country. Please would you give wisdom to all those who are in authority at this time, and especially to Boris Johnson and those who advise him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we thank you that you always hear the prayers of your people and never abandon them. Give special grace to those who suffer for their faith in countries such as North Korea, India, Iran, China and Nigeria. Would they know that you are with them and that you will never forsake them? As they wait for the return of your son, help them to fix their eyes on that day when mourning and crying and death and pain Will be a thing of the past. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> All loving Father, we pray now for those who are suffering, for those who are ill, for those who are unemployed, for those who are under pressure in their places of work, for those who are lonely, for those who are grieving, the loss of a loved one, for those who are struggling with mental health. In a moment of quiet we lift those known to us up to God in prayer. Please would each of those we have named know that you are close to the broken hearted, would they draw near to you and would you bind up their wounds comfort them and heal them. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Drawing our prayers to a close, we say together the Lord's Prayer using the modern words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Before we finish, we sing our final hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly upon you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen.